Cleaning up the space junk, Japan launches a mission which will latch onto dead orbital objects and hurdle them into the atmosphere to burn up. A 21-year-old bottle of wine returns after 12 months on the space station. It's a little older for the experience. Plus, Southern Launch Australia gets its licence to launch suborbital payloads. Our special coverage. It's 2021's 13th week. On Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts and YouTube. With the latest science and space news, this is Talkin' Science with Dr Brad Tucker and Matt Miller. Welcome to Talking Science. Matt Miller with you with another instalment of the Science and Space News. Dr. Brad Tucker is here as he is every Tuesday. Bless you, Brad, and welcome to the show. <laughs> yeah, it's a rough start to a Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> it is certainly a very interesting time, especially for us here in Brisbane. I can't get to Adelaide now with this COVID cluster that's growing, but we still have coverage on Trek Zone's Twitter and hopefully a few interviews as well. It's the 11th Australian, I was going to say annual, but it's not annual. It's the Australian Space Forum tomorrow in Adelaide, Brad. Yes, uh, it started as a South Australian to annual or to Australian to mostly whenever we can have it uh, form now because, well, life just likes to throw in some spanners. <laughs> Yes, it certainly does. Well, before we get into the show, a quick reminder of the socials. Uh, we can find you on Twitter at btucker22. I'm on Twitter at miramat86 and, of course, Trexone exclusively on Twitter. Plus, find our YouTube channel for the latest steps and the podcasting apps of choice. We're there. We're everywhere. Brad, let's get into it. Uh, first up, UNSW's Canberra Space's M2 satellites are showing remarkable promise for Aussie defence space technology. Yeah, so, you know, M2 Pathfinder was launched last year on Rocket Labs and then on the latest Rocket Labs last week, uh, the, the full version of M2 uh, was launched. It's the first time also doing formation flying, so having the two satellites fly uh, near each other or together with each other. Um, so a lot of great technology from essentially a, a very homegrown uh, Australian-led enterprise in terms of the satellite building at UNSW Canberra uh, and tested and getting ready for space uh, up here at Mount Shromlo where I work. And it's very exciting times ahead. Well, NASA has given Earth the all clear for roughly 100 years. Apophis isn't going to slam into us in 2068. This is good news. It is good news. Apophis was one of those that was kind of uh, hanging around like a bad smell, so to speak, uh, <laughs> where it, it is a potentially hazardous asteroid. Uh, and the the time or the, the orbital pass in 2068, people were worried about, about how close it was going to get, um, but more data and a better, ref therefore, better refinement uh, of its orbit has shown that, no, it doesn't really pose uh, any danger to us here on Earth in 2068. So it's not for at least 100 years that we have to worry about uh, the asteroid Apophis. Well, into our stories of the week now, and we've talked about Space Junk on the show before, but now a Japanese company is doing something about it, launching LCD to try and clear up our orbit. Yeah, this is one of the one of the many initiatives that are actually happening of how to deal uh, with space junk. Uh, you know, here where I work again in Mount Stromlo, dealing with lots of small um, human-made space junk, uh, but bits of debris, essentially, little tiny bits. Uh, we saw last year, the year before, the UK, the University of Surrey, launched this magnetic net uh, trying to get bigger pieces. And yeah, as you said, this satellite, what it's trying to do is to grapple old, essentially CubeSats, small sats, pull them in at the end of their life, and then when they collect those satellites, bring them back down into Earth's atmosphere to deorbit uh, and safely get rid of them. Well, over the next six months, a team in the UK is going to run the catch and release manoeuvres multiple times to try and prove the technology, hopefully ending some of the threats posed to GPS, communication and other satellites that we have in orbit and we rely on so heavily. Yeah, look, you know, the, pro the problem we have is those satellites can stay up there for decades. And once you lose control of them, whether because they run out of fuel, they break, they go bad, in any of the reasons... Uh, as they go get out of control, uh, they, they do pose a threat to all those other existing satellites. And that is the real worry that people have. And so if there's a way of trying to 
essentially safely dispose of these satellites, well, then it's a better way to operate in space. We have a solution to some of these satellites. And so it's just one of the many new technologies coming on board to try and deal with this really growing uh, space junk problem. Well, it's going to be a challenge for Elsa D with NASA estimating that there are at least 26,000 pieces of softball-sized space junk and more than 500,000 pieces of mission-ending threat size. Uh, these are things like blowing up uh, fuel tanks and uh, habita- habitation setups as well. So uh, there's there's a lot out there. There's a lot in orbit, uh, like I said, that we've talked about before. Hopefully Elsa D uh, works and, and we can start deploying these things into orbit. That's exactly right, you know, because they, they do pose a threat and it is a, it's, it, it's a real issue, um, one that we have to find a way of solving. Uh, and as we launch more and more satellites, as we do more and more things, more bits of these debris are generated. We're generating less because we're getting smarter about it, but they still are being generated. They still exist. And then the potential collisions increase. And it, it is a recipe for disaster, one that obviously uh, everyone would like to avoid. Now, this isn't the first effort to clean up the junk. Uh, in 2016, a Japanese tether tried to slow down and redirect some objects. In 2018, removed debris successfully cast a net around a dummy satellite. And new mandates on launches, as you just alluded to, they're, they're mitigating future threats as well. So we're we're working forward, but we've got to look look at the past over the last 50, 60 years of launches and uh, and sort those out. Exactly. That's right. You know, there's there's a lot of back work uh, to do and to clean up, and it doesn't it doesn't happen overnight, and so and you can't do every single piece of debris. You can't do all of it as well. So you have to do different parts, different sizes, and employ different technologies. You know, we're using lasers here at Mount Stromlo to work on the very small bits, the centimeter sky size thing that pose a threat to missions as well. So there's a huge body of work in the community, and a huge part of the community doing this. So it's great to see another mission or another type uh, step forward in the right direction. Well, Brad, next up for the wine aficionados out there, a a dozen bottles of the French good stuff have returned after 12 months on the space station. Yeah, we were talking about this uh, last month when uh, this Bordeaux wine was brought back on one of the ISS cargo missions uh, from space and it was being designed or tested to see what are the effects of space on wine uh, from the fermentation to uh, all the other bits that it encounter, so to speak. And it was an interesting question. Now, you know, does space affect the taste, the quality, the tanning, you know, all these little things that people care about with wine? Um, <laughs> and more so in our standing, how does affect just more or space more broadly affect Plant matter, uh, vegetable matter, fruit matter, organic matter uh, is a big question in these goals of getting to the moon and Mars. And so some really cool results is showing that the the wine in space aged a couple of extra years compared to the wine on ground, that essentially space accelerated uh, the aging process in wine. Well, connoisseurs have already tasted one of those bottles, a 21-year-old Chateau Petrus Merlot. And compared to a drop that stayed behind, as you say, uh, it aged a little bit more. It had a little bit more extra floral character. Brad, are you a wine buff? Do you know what they're talking about? And and could you taste the difference? I know there's red and white. Um, (laughs) That's probably uh, the the extent of my knowledge of wine. But... um, People apparently care about this stuff. And and look, I'm not demeaning. There are people who know what they're talking about here. I'm not one of them. But they also have done some chemical tests as well to actually see the differences. They've looked at some of the the tanning to actually again see there are real differences here. I think also one of the interesting things, they did send up vines that they will then also, uh, I assume, plant in some sort of experiment and let mature. Do Do the vines carry any lasting effect from being in space, if just a bottle in a year accelerates it, you know it's a it's a very expensive way to age your wine. Well, it absolutely is. One bottle of this good stuff is worth about six thousand US dollars, uh, so it's not a cheap experiment, but it's certainly one as we're looking to spend longer and longer in space and form habitations as well. Can we take some of the creature comforts from home? Is it going to taste the same? Can we make similar stuff in orbit? I'm sure a moon vintage would be uh, extremely, extremely well received. 
Yeah, that, that's exactly right. People want to use and do this and apply it more. Um, and we're going to want these things, comforts and necessities in space. And there will be things where we have to preserve, pickle, uh, ferment foods and vegetables and fruits in space for our normal, uh, not just human lifestyle, but human support. Um, so it's important to actually understand these questions. And, you know, the more we do these experiments in space of seeing how the, the nature of space affects things, the more we're surprised by the results, not that we're surprised there will be interesting results, but the range uh, and variety of results we get back. Well, lastly this week, Brad, uh, I highlighted this on Friday's news podcast, but it's certainly worth of a bit more time. Southern Launch Australia has been awarded the country's first launch licence. Yeah, the, you know, we talked about it last year when they had their first launch. Uh, you know, it is a big step for Australia. And this is... One of those things a few years ago, even even at the beginning of the space agency a few years ago, that launching rockets and that ability was not going to necessarily be a big part of the Australian landscape, at least so we thought. Uh, and now that not only are there multiple groups looking at this, but now, as you said, that first launch license exists. This is a very interesting um, way of growing the industry in space here. Last year, we covered their launch to the edge of space, as you say. That was permitted under special permission from our Civil Aviation Safety Authority. Now, though, SLA can launch these suborbital payloads, uh, which will gather data before they fall back to Earth. So we're not launching into orbit just yet, but uh, certainly the very first step uh, in that journey. Yeah, look, I mean, you don't just launch overnight. You don't just become in the rocket business launching to the moon. It takes time, it takes practice. You know, and there's still even reasons of doing some orbital or sounding rocket launches. There's still a lot of science that we do that NASA does on these things. So this is not just a we are behind. This is this is the step in the right direction. It's still a capability increase of what we're having, and, and it grows in the right area. And we'll see... Um, Lots of different uh, options coming on board in the future in Australia for uh, domestic uh, launch capability. And ultimately what you want is the ability as someone in Australia to be able to come up with the idea of a satellite and see the process from build, build and design to testing and preparing for space to launch into space all in Australia, and this is just one of those pieces of the, the necessary pie, so to speak, that we need to have in place. Well, we have to give special recognition to the Kaniba Community Aboriginal Corporation. It is their land on which the launches will proceed. But as we talked about uh, with Equatorial Launch in Arnhem Land in the country's north last year, it's definitely a boost to the local community and the local economy as well. That's exactly right. There's there's multiple benefits. There's multiple uh, groups that benefit from this. And, you know, when people flock all the time to see rocket launches, there's huge tourism capabilities. There's huge ways of, of, of doing unique outreach and engagement of talking to Aboriginal astronomy and seeing a rocket launch all in the same place. That, that's something you can't get anywhere else in the world. That would be an amazing thing. So I think the potential and the excitement here is 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 well do um you know and just imagine in 10 years when we start to see this more and more commonplace and again we have to partially think the existence of the space agency that now we can do these things and in fact it is the existence of the space agency that is allowing these things to take place where before it, it would have been really hard to get across the line uh and with old policies yeah, it absolutely would uh, would have been a challenge. It, it's a little bit of a challenge at the moment with some of the things that the space agency is uh, wanting to impose uh, upwards uh, over a hundred thousand uh, dollars for launch licenses. But Southern Launch definitely there with Kaniba and Whaler's Way that they're building as well. Uh, certainly a company to watch uh, in the Australian space race, as it were. Uh, it's an internal fun competition that we're doing uh, to try and uh, just build this industry from the ground up. It's very very, very exciting uh, to to see it in its infancy and where it's heading. Yeah, there's lots of potential and there's lots of I get real um, science and capability that we'll see out of having all of these areas 
as well. And, and when we looked at it, when we talk about the existence of the space agency, and it wasn't supposed to be a NASA type thing, but support uh, the companies and the industries already in Australia and help them accelerate, we're, we're seeing that. This is exactly what we're seeing and paying dividends of. You don't need an overarching group to do everything, but someone to help and support and coordinate so all the other groups can work together. It's exactly what we're seeing now. Well, lastly, Brad, a quick plug for the next Talk and Science interview. Dr. Graham Walker is beaming in to chat about getting everyone involved in science. He makes it fun and energetic. And we're already planning to drop by his lecture for an in-person demo of some of his experiments. I know he works with you uh, as well. So it's fun to, to chat with him. That interview is going to be out on Thursday with a link on the YouTube video right there in the card. Uh, and uh, it's a fun one. People should uh, go and check it out. But another big week of Talk and Science, as always, it's great to pick apart the stories of the week with you, Brad. We're going to do it again next Tuesday. Thanks for being here. Have a good week. Thanks. Keep up to date with Twitter. Catch new podcasts daily on YouTube. Plus, we're beaming to your favourite podcast app five days a week. Just search for Trek Zone.